everyone, and thank you for coming to this webinar on nuclear resource utilization. I'm Jennifer Schaefer, and I'm a program director at ARPA-E, and I would like to tell you about what we're interested in this space. So in order to do this, let's go ahead and talk, do a little nuclear energy overview. And so right now, it turns that 29 states have at least one commercial nuclear reactor. Two nuclear reactors are anticipated to start up in 2021, and these are the Volo reactors in Georgia. And it turns out that actually 55% of the carbon-free U.S. electricity is nuclear. And another interesting data point down here is that nine of the 10 highest generating U.S. power plants were nuclear. And so basically what you can see on this quick overview slide is that nuclear is a really important piece of our low CO2 and carbon-free economy moving forward. And so there's an interesting piece of nuclear that needs to be discussed and is sometimes maybe not thought about quite as much, and it's the nuclear waste piece. And here's a little bit of a cartoon, maybe funny, maybe not so funny, about the reality that we are basically leaving behind nuclear waste for generations to come as far as the management of it. And this is something that we'd like to be considering more seriously. And so it turns out currently that it's costing us $6 billion annually not to dispose of this waste in some form of final geological repository and just in general manage the material. And this comes from this uh, reference right down here. When we look at commercial news, uh, used nuclear fuel in the United States, you can see that basically it's dispersed throughout the nation and frequently is co-located with basically many different reactor sites in the world or in the U.S. today. And currently, there are 80,000 metric tons of used nuclear fuel in the U.S. And we are projected to have 140,000 metric tons of used fuel projected by 2035. And this excludes new builds. And so some reactors are coming offline, some reactors are coming online. This is just a rough approximation of what this could look like uh, by 2035. It turns out that under our current deployment of a once through nuclear fuel cycle, that most likely multiple repositories might be necessary basically using this approach. And ultimately limiting the amount of nuclear material destined for a repository would limit the burden on the environment as well as the public. And so this is what we are interested in reviewing more seriously. There is fortunately some really great opportunity for innovation in this space. And basically what I have shown here on the right is the hazard index of material compared to natural uranium. And what we have here, if you go to this 10 to the zero value, or basically the value of one, this is the hazard index of natural uranium as it sits in the ground. And so basically if you're above this line with the data up here, you're at a place where you're more hazardous than natural uranium in the ground. And if you're below this line, then you're presumably less hazardous than natural uranium in the ground. And since we've lived with natural uranium in the ground for basically the entirety of human civilization, there's sort of a general acceptance that if you're below this line, that you are most likely in a situation where you would be in sort of a default safe state as far as managing the nuclear waste. And so ultimately our goal is to basically get below this line as far as waste management practice. It turns out that the best way to kind of look at this is here is our total line for our basically hazard index from all of the radionuclide constituents that are present in the nuclear waste and use nuclear fuel. And so what you can see here is that if we completely leave this waste untreated, that it's at some point millions of years in the future where basically we are back to being comparable to the hazard index of natural uranium. And this is basically longer than the course of human civilization. And so it's really hard to talk about this articulately as far as what a management plan could look like for uh, used nuclear fuel basically millions of years from now. So we'd like to hopefully shorten that. So let's go ahead and look at what happens if you take out the uranium, the plutonium, the neptunium, and americium, and curium. So if you take out all of these actinides, then basically what you are left with is just the cesium and the strontium that are significantly contributing to the long-term waste management problem associated with the used nuclear fuel. And actually what we have here is after several hundred years, basically you would be below the hazard index of natural uranium. And this is a much more tractable and manageable situation. And interestingly also compares to the management problem associated with CO2 in our atmosphere. So now we're starting to talk about waste management strategies that look much more comparable to currently deployed technologies. And we actually have a very coherent path forward as far as how to manage this. And so some pieces as well about looking at the management and recovery of uranium, plutonium, neptunium, americium, and curium. 
It turns out that the once through fuel cycle actually utilizes only about 0.7% of the uranium. So we're not re really utilizing that resource very well. And the reason for that is basically there are fission products that grow in, these are isotopes and elements, that basically decrease the neutron efficiency of the reactor and inhibit the fission process, which is responsible for power production. And so basically, short story long, we're not using this resource very well. It also turns out, though, that if we did some separations chemistry, that you could actually improve your repository performance by actually recovering things like americium and fissioning them in something called a fast spectrum nuclear reactor, some of which are under development as a part of our advanced reactor uh, campaign and basically deployment strategy. And what happens after you're able to separate that material is you can put it in a fast spectrum neutron, neutron reactor make it fission products, and then this would significantly shorten the waste management timeline, and this is basically what I have shown here on this slide. So in order to enable this slide, we actually need separations chemistry. And so here's the challenge to overcome with this. And so if we look at our current once through nuclear fuel cycle, that you can see that there are many steps that are actually a part of this. Everything from recovering the mining material out of the ground, basically purifying this, converting it to a fluoride form that's appropriate for enrichment. And then you convert this into uranium oxide fuel. You put this into a reactor, you allow it to cool down, and then ultimately this is faded for waste disposal. However, there's actually a step that you can take, which is that separation step, that actually enables you to basically put the material back into a fuel form that is appropriate for either use in our current light water fleet or as appropriate for an advanced reactor technology and for transmutation of those actinides, which are responsible for the long-term waste management problem. And so when we look at recycling here, there are some unique challenges that need to be considered more thoroughly. And so what are those? One of the primary risks associated with recycling or used nuclear fuel is the potential risk of a clean plutonium stream which could potentially by di be diverted for weapons use. And so this is something that we really need to be attentive to as far as preventing it and discouraging the use of the plutonium in this way. And we believe that there are technical solutions that RPE could help support develop in, in the management of this. So also current facilities are actually quite costly. And so you can look at something like this and see that a facility could be on the order of at least one to $5 billion. And this is something that's really just not a price point that's really very attractive or compatible with the current economics of uranium. And also one thing that we keep in mind is that the current technology that we've developed is not designed for the streamlined recovery of fuel cycle relevant actinides such as uranium, neptunium, plutonium, and americium. And so basically what we would really like to do is recover these actinides in one group to help with potential proliferation risk and also economics of the fuel cycle. What I have shown here is basically a solvent extraction system, and this is sort of the classical technology that's been used for nuclear fuel recycling, but there are other potential technologies that RPE would be interested in if they could address the problems highlighted on this slide here. And so, that brings us basically to ARPA-E's interests. And ultimately, what I would say the project goal of any research in this area would be to increase the attractiveness of recycling technology by significantly improving not only the economics, but also the security challenges inherent with potential uh, generation of technologies that could be diverted, and, and I should say materials that could be diverted for weapons use. And so we could consider things like monitoring technologies. And these basically, where we are at here is it would be really helpful if we could improve the data collection and trading models uh, for such technologies. These technologies I would define as being as in the very nascent stages, but we spend a lot of time basically developing training models and data collection for these. And so this needs to be microwaved if we are going to really use this as a viable approach for monitoring our used nuclear fuel processing strategies. We would also like from the ground up development of chemistry that actually supports non-proliferation goals, basically associated with separation technologies. And this could look a lot of different ways, but ultimately we wanna mitigate the generation of such uh, streams that would allow for the diversion of uh, weapons type materials. 
And then also there might be even conceptual facility design uh, that supports security by design principles and also viable economics. And so these are things that we are interested in considering more. And then most importantly, since this is RPE, we're very attentive to that tech to market pathway. And we really would like to see partnerships with advanced reactor companies to encourage translation of this technology to make sure that we are meeting market demand. And so thank you so much for coming to this webinar. Please don't hesitate if you have any questions of me.